Now that you have seen the definition of a stable model, let's explore the concept by a couple of examples. Now the first example has two rules, P if P and Q if not P or Q unless P. And here the idea is a little bit to say, okay, even though there is a rule that gives us P, uh, we will never actually get a terminating proof or a fin actually a finite proof for P. And since P will not be derivable, actually we would expect to get Q. That's a bit the intuition with this example. Now let's just run through this. So we have two atoms, P and Q, hence we have four possibilities that we have to investigate as solution candidates. Now we do this with a table. So here are the four solution candidates the, uh, uh, from the empty range from the empty set to the set where P and Q are both contained. Then we will have a look at the, at the reduct of the program depending on the depending on the on the guest solution candidate and then we will calculate the consequence and see actually whether what we compute then coincides with what we have initially guessed okay now let's start with in the first in the first line here right we have we start with the empty set we reduce the program actually before doing that also note that whenever we uh, calculate the reduct we only look at the negative part so here there is a negative body literal, but here there is no negative body literal. So the only thing that is of interest for the reduct at least is this um, uh, negative body literal. And after all, depending on whether it's true or false, we will either erase this or erase the whole rule. Okay, now I zip it and we, uh, <laughs> well, and we keep on uh, looking at the example. So we have the empty set and we look at the reduct. So in this case, P is not contained in the, in the empty set. Good. So not P is true. And what remains is the positive part of this rule is Q if no condition. So Q more as a fact. So that's what we have here with the reduction. Now looking at this, we already can do the computation of, 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 of the consequences, right? So we have a fact Q. So Q more or less uh, must be in the, in the consequences. And, but nothing else, more or less, we have, because to apply this rule, we would need P, we don't have it, we don't get P. So the consequences of this are merely Q. And this is not what we guessed at the beginning or what we started out with. So this is not a stable model. And I keep using this uh, green hook and the red cross to indicate whether something is a stable model or not. Now, in the second case, we assume that uh, P holds or we assume that P is true or whatever, then we reduce the program. And again, now here, since we have P, P is inside, um, this, <clears throat> this, at, this negative body literal is false and the rule is satisfied so we can actually remove it because it, it doesn't contribute anything. So given that this guy is false, there may be Q, there may not be Q. The rule is satisfied. Good. So anyway, so we, our reduct only contains P of P and you see now when we, when we would apply our procedure to, to calculate the consequences, we would not have any facts. So we would not get the whole thing off the ground. We get no conclusions. We get the empty set. And again, this is not what we started out with. So we didn't get, we couldn't reproduce uh, the, the, the candidate. Now we assume Q and this is the same case as we had at the, at the beginnings. P is not contained in this set. Hence, the positive part of this rule remains and our reduct is the same as in the first case. And now again, as, as here, we get the set Q. And this is now exactly what we uh, supposed at the beginning. And this is a stable model. So we found our first stable model. And unfortunately, it'll be the last for this example, because if we assume that both P and Q are true, again, we now have P in, in, our, uh, in our guess. This means that the rule can be eliminated. We get P of P, we get no consequences. This is not what we guessed, so we couldn't reproduce anything. So we don't get a stable model. So the only stable model that we get here is actually Q. And some of that's cute, right? Because uh, we can derive Q because we cannot derive P. And so somehow, given that we have a bottom-up procedure, or actually there's, a, there's not even a procedure here, there's a characterization, but in this formalism, that there is actually a loop 
uh, where procedural approaches that would go top down or whatever, right, would run into loops and would never terminate. That's not a problem here. So we get just Q. And again, one way to read, to read this second rule is to say we get Q unless we get P. And well, again, there's no reason to get P because we have an infinite loop there. We had an infinite loop there. So Q is the right conclusion. I'm happy with that. Now, before we close this example, let's look at the at contrast the stable models with the classical models. So these are the stable models. And again, in classical logic, we do open world reasoning, right? So here we can actually assume P or not. And what we actually get, we get two more models, right? And in both models, is, is we more or less, P was unknown. So we set it under closed world reasoning, we set it to false. And this is why we get this model here. So sorry, I can show it like, so that's why we got this model here. But under open world reasoning, we have, we look at all the, all the possibilities. So P can also be true. And once P is true, uh, this here is false and the rule is, is vacuous. Hence, we can again, we don't know whether Q holds. So we have a situation where Q is false and Q is true. And this is what open world reasoning does. We just, all, everything that is unknown, all the possibilities can be, can be taken into account. Okay, anyway, that's our first example. Here's another one. The second example somehow has a, let's say, non-deterministic flavor because we get P unless we have Q and we have Q unless we get P. So it's a bit like when you la launch a, a coin, you get head unless you have tail and you have tail unless you have head. So more or less, there are two alternative outcomes to be expected. Let's see actually how this works out with our definitions. Again, we have two atoms, hence four possibilities, and we go through the reduct and the consequences of that. In the first line, uh, we now start with the empty set. In this case, neither Q nor P are in the set. So uh, this means that not Q and not P can be assumed to be true. And we re the remainder is in the reduct is P as a fact and Q as a fact. That's what we have here. Now we launch uh, the calculation of the consequences of this positive program and we get P and Q. Oh, we quite overshot. We started with nothing and get P and Q in the end. No, that's not a stable model. Now, if we assume that P is true, then of course Q is not in the set and we keep the fact that P from this rule here, while uh, P is in the set, so the whole rule gets eliminated here in, in, in this alternative. Now, we push the button, calculate the, the consequences of this positive program, of course we get P, and this is exactly what we started out with. Great, so this is a stable model. That's the stable model that describes one alternative solution which, in which P is true, or which contains P, if you think more in terms of sets. Good, and well, more or less symmetrically, if we now assume Q, we retain the fact that uh, Q is true, we compute the constants, we get Q, and we get the second stable model. That's, and, and that's more or less what uh, one, one, one expects. Now, finally, let's check whether having both is an option. And actually, no, because if we have P and Q, uh, both rules are eliminated, the reduct is empty, we compute the consequences of the empty positive program, which is the empty set, and again, we could not reproduce either of them. And this is not a stable model. Okay. So again, the, here we, we see the first time actually a, a, a logic program, a normal logic program that has two alternative solutions. And actually in practice, this will be the case all the time, right? Because we look at problems which have, um, where you take decisions under constraints and, and we get normally alternative solutions. So this is not an exception, that's the rule. And again, keep in mind, how many solutions are there in classical logic? Just looking at this example again, right? We get two stable models, but in fact, the last uh, model, or P and Q, is actually a classical model, again, with the, same, with the same idea. So you can make P and Q true, then you more or less kill the prerequisites, the rules do not say anything, and you can just also then uh, stick with the assumption that they are true. You don't need a proof for them. That's open world reasoning. Because after all, the other alternatives uh, are given here. Good. So again, open world reasoning, classical logic yields an, an, an additional model. Okay, so let's look at the last example. 
which actually is a bit this uh, Münchhausen thingy, right? So we say that we have P unless we have P, or P if not P. And somehow this is a circle that we can't really resolve and we will see that this works out in exactly this way. So now we have only one atom and hence we have only two alternatives to consider. In the first case we assume that we do not obtain P. This means this P is not uh, contained in here, so not P is eliminated. So we retain the fact P, we get this here. Then we push the button, calculate the consequences, we get P. Well, but now we overshot, we got more than we, we, we backed for at the beginning. This is not a stable model. In the other direction, let's assume that we have P. Um, then, well, then not P is, is, so to speak, false. This rule is vacuous. We can remove it. We get the empty, the empty uh, positive program. We calculate the consequences, not now obtained. And now actually we started out with P, but we cannot reproduce it. This isn't a stable model either. So this program actually has no stable model at all. Again, in this case, uh, one could say that, well, um, classically, the, here the open world assumption plays not, not really in our favor, but there is actually another classical model, and this is the second one, because again, the idea is, if you assume P, then this, you eliminate this rule, and once you eliminate it, no one prevents you from saying that P is true, right? And so you get this other uh, classical model. Now for the case actually where P is false, where, we, um, where this is, is, is true, right? And then we get P. This is of course also a contradiction in, in the classical sense, hence this is not an option. Actually for those of you who know logic a little bit, in classical logic, this implication here can be transformed into a disjunction. And this would be P or P. So in, to be exact, it would be P or not, not P, and two, two negations go to P. So this is P or P, which is P, and then of course you get P. Okay, that's actually why you get here the, the, this model here in classical logic. But again, we believe, or at least I, I believe in this, in this, uh, in this uh, implication here as a genuine connective, and hence there is no way that this example gives you a stable model. It only gives you, well, it only gives you uh, classical models. Good. So finally, let's look at some properties. The first bullet simply confirms what what we have already observed on the three examples we went through: a logic program. And now this is again a normal logic program that may have positive and negative body literals, may have no one or several stable models. The second thing um, that I already mentioned when we went through the examples, um, well, in a, in a former part is, if X is a stable model of a logic program, then all the atoms that are in X belong to the heads of the program. Because the rules, more or less, they are the only way that you can produce an atom. And so if you have a program with, I don't know, a thousand atoms, but only uh, two of them occur in the heads, then you only have to look at these two atoms in the head, right? So this is, I think, one thing one should keep in mind, in particular when you're doing your exercises, right? If you see something with a lot of atoms and only a few in the head, well, take care, check it out. Okay, then the other thing that we've already seen is if X is a stable model of a logic program, it is also a model of the logic program, if you look at it in, in, in classical logic. This means that more or less this, this um, property of stability, you take the stable models and you select those that are stable. So you, with the stable model semantics, you have like a selection on the classical models of a program. Okay, and last but not least, this is also a nice property that may not make much sense now, but afterwards when it comes to modeling, it's actually pretty cool. So if you have two stable models, then you can be sure that one is never contained in the other. Again, when they are normal. We will see later on actually that if you have choices in the heads that this property will not hold again. But in classical logic, you may, you may have models that are all contained into each other, right? Because you can add redundancies. We've seen this before. Keep in mind, in, in ASP, the, the, or stable models, the idea is always to, to have closed sets 
uh, that are as small as possible, only when things can be derived. But if you just have closed sets, and these are actually classical models, then there can be redundancies, because you can add things and not even a rule produces it. So, and, but in stable models, many, this cannot happen. Whenever you have two stable models, one can never be contained in the other. So there can never be a situation that one contains redundant information that was already stripped off in another model. Okay, anyway, so interesting property, even though right now it comes perhaps a bit out of the blue. Actually, yeah, blue and white. Okay, joke. Good, so last but not least, let's look at some exemplary logic programs. I actually call these examples exemplars because they stand for some typical situation that you may also encounter during modeling. That's also why I put this now in typewriter to give you more the flavor of um, source code. Anyway, <clears throat> so the very first thing just says that if there is a fact, it will always be in all stable models. There's no way that you could block a fact. Obvious, right? So if you have a rule and a positive prerequisite and this positive um, body literal is not derivable, the rule will not apply, right? So hence you get, you, you don't get, in this case with, with a single rule, you get nothing in your stable model. Now, once afterwards this, uh, this lacking this, the, 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 the positive body literal is added as a fact or some, somehow otherwise. Of course, this guy will be in the stable model here because it's a fact. And then the rule will also apply and you will get both of them. Here you actually see something like a monotonic behavior, right? So here you couldn't prove A, but now that uh, the prerequisite is there, you can also prove A and your set of conclusions augments. Now, here is a potential proof, in the next exam there is a potential proof for B, but these two rules are cyclic. So you can prove A if you can prove B, and you can prove B if you can prove A, and you're back to square one. So you will never find a proof. And keep in mind that the notion of a proof works on the positive programs, right? So you, you want to have, in, in the positive program, you want to have, uh, let's say, a sequence of rules that start from one or several facts, and then the rule applies, and you finally get your conclusion here with this cycle. You cannot uh, derive, you can neither derive A nor B. So this is why you get here an empty stable model. Now the four remaining examples have a negative uh, body literal inside. So C. So let's proceed a bit analogously as uh, as here. So here you get A unless you have C. So in this case you actually get A because you have not heard about C. You don't see it. It's not there, right? It's undefined and closed world reasoning and so stable model semantics sets it to false. The rule applies and you get A. Great. But now when you add C as a fact, uh, then this rule does not apply anymore. And the conclusion that was forthcoming before is not coming, it cannot be obtained afterwards anymore. Now we have a non-monotonic behavior. Well, what does this mean? So we had a rule in our program and we were drawing a conclusion. Now we augment our program. So we we have a program, we make our program bigger, but the conclusions that we get is not getting bigger. Actually, they are different now, right? So this is then non-monotonic. Okay, now if we have a cycle that goes in this, so A, we get A unless we get C, and we have C unless we have A. Here, in this case, we don't have to, to prove things so strictly as before, it's enough if we don't get a proof for something, right? So there is, a, there is actually a scenario where we can imagine that we have A un, since we don't have C and we, we have C unless we have A. So in this way we get these two scenarios that we have, as we have shown before in the example. Here we have such a, such a cyclic situation through negation leads to two alternative um, stable models and two alternative solutions. One thing that is important to note, and the interesting thing is, that this seems to be a universal principle, because even in physics and biology, they talk about even and odd loops. And you get the same behavior actually here. Uh, so here, if you look at the dependencies, so from A, you go once through a negation to C, then you go to C, and then another time through a negation, you go to A, and then back here. So you went through two negations in this circle. This is an even loop. And even loops, more or less, uh, give rise to alternatives. So you see here A and C. While in this example here, A if not A, 
you start with you start with a, then you go through a again through one negation, and you go back. So this is an odd loop, and odd loops you can, we can find no solution. And again, this example we treated this uh, before just with with with, uh, with the letter p, right? And here we get no solution. So that's actually a pretty interesting thing that that concepts like even and odd loops that show up in natural sciences also show up in computer science. So and also do not somehow think that this is negative to have no solution because you can use this to destroy unwanted solution candidates. And we will see this later on, notably with the notion of integrity constraints. This is more or less at the heart of the integrity constraints. It's a condition that must not be satisfied by any solution and this is the way one can implement it. Anyway, so just to give you these, these eight examples as a bit of a guiding line of, of the essential features of, of stable model semantics, that may actually become useful also when you, when you are modeling. Uh, in case you want to understand a bit what's happening, you can look which of these features here applies. And uh, anyway, I hope this was useful. And this was quite a long, a long section on the semantics. And this is more or less the end of this. And in the next uh, section, we will talk about reasoning. Well, stay tuned and see you then. Bye.